What's up nerds? My name is Jen Sudarova and this is my channel and today I want to talk to you about one of the greatest revolutionaries in the history of this planet. It's Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. The greatest Marxist and the greatest, one of the most glorified villains on the planet, I think. And, um, and I also will do my makeup. And one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about Lenin in particular is because how many people perished in this? And everybody I know from Soviet Union whose family is from there, everybody was touched by the Red Terror and that's something that Lenin created. And uh, it's believed that anywhere between 10,000 to 150,000 people perished in Red Terror throughout the years. And this is no small number. And till this day, Lenin is still being glorified. He is basically mummified body is still lying there uh, right by besides Kremlin in Moscow um, so his image is still alive although that man if you think of it the time that he spent in Moscow actually being in charge of the country um, wasn't even that long and we're gonna get to that so stay tuned if you're new to my channel please like and subscribe for me videos like this or other thought-provoking discussions about policy politics and history So Lenin's childhood was pretty, you know, good. Um, although his family did deal with a lot of a lot of loss, and loss of his loved ones did uh, was uh, part of his life throughout, throughout um, all throughout. Although back in those days, um, the medicine was at the point when you know a lot of people died very young, and then people could just die from some common disease, like you could get flu and die. But anyway, so Lenin was born in 1870, and he was born to quite a quite a good, a wealthy family. Um, his mother was actually part of aristocracy, and on his mother's side, uh, his great granddad um, was Jewish, and uh, he switched to Christianity. He became Christian only because Jewish people were not allowed to attend universities uh, back in the day in Russia. It was like in the mid of 1800s, right? And suicide was something also that was part of his family life because um, his great uncle and his uncle both committed suicide. Um, and also, um, when he got sick later on in his life, Lenin was asking his, his um, wife and Stalin at the time, who was his friend at the time, he asked them to give him cyanide so he could kill himself. He was a smart kid and he went to school, and um, actually, one of his uh, his principal at his school was the father of Kerensky, who played a big part in the revolution. He was part, Kerensky was actually a Menshevik, so the Communist Party was split into two, and so Kerensky was in charge of one of them. But let's move back to uh, his childhood. So, but what, what actually uh, is kind of standing out in his childhood is um, his relationship with his brother, older brother, and Alexander. And uh, Alexander was also very, he was a smart kid actually. Alexander was pretty talented and he went to study at the St. Petersburg University and he became interested in biology and sciences. And he was doing really well and they were celebrating his accomplishments back at home. But then what happened was he became part of a Zemlyachistvo. Zemlyachistvo is a group of people from a particular region. So those were probably people who were, um, you know, grew up around the same area that where his Lenin's brother and Lenin grew up and they started studying Marxism and the reason that Marxism's, Marxism became popular in Russia it's actually nothing really weird because a lot of, of Russian um, aristocracy uh, went to school in Europe and so they were really fascinated by the European ideas and Marxism was just one of them. So Alexander, Lenin's brother, uh, became part of the group that studied it, but also they were a terrorist organization and they were trying to kill Alexander III. At the time, Alexander III was one of those emperors of Russia who they tried to kill him like five or six times. Different groups tried to kill him a bunch of times. And um, uh, Lenin's brothers, Alexander's group, did not succeed. Alexander's brother actually ended up being uh, caught and he was hung. And that's something that traumatized traumatized Lenin a lot. 
So, and that kind of sets him off because just be a little bit, a few years before that, still when, when Lenin was a teenager, Lenin's um, father died. And that's another really traumatic point for him. That's the point when Lenin starts saying that he doesn't believe in God anymore uh, because, um, because if God existed, according to Lenin, something tragic like that wouldn't have happened to him and his family. Lenin becomes gloomy and sad, something his brain definitely changed, something his in his perception of reality has changed. And he becomes obsessed with this idea that his, his uh, brother set him on a path that he has to accomplish, he has to accomplish what his brother hasn't. So uh, Lenin graduates from uh, high school and he now goes to a university that's not too far from where he lives. Um, it's a Kazan University. Actually, I was born not too far from there. But um, he goes there to go to college, basically, right? Uh, but uh, what's gonna end up happening is that he's gonna join kind of a similar group that his brother would join, Zemlyachistva, and he would start um, um, revolutionary or uh, at least, you know, becomes engaged in actions that are trying to overthrow the government. At that point, uh, only three months after he starts college, he gets kicked out because he basically didn't go to college that much. Um, he just he was just there to to engage in, you know, studying communism, studying Marxism, and uh, trying to get a group together to overthrow the government in one way or the other. And he gets thrown out, and then his family and him they move to Samara, another Russian town. It's kind of further out west, oh, further out east, I should say, and um, they move there, and uh, his mother is trying to get him involved in activities that would distract him from Marxism and those ideas, right? Uh, so she she bought a, a piece of land that had some people working on it, and uh, he, she, he tried, actually, Lenin tried to engage in those agricultural activities to be a farmer of some sorts but uh, he didn't like it and he actually writes to his friends at the time that I don't really like it uh, I don't like the relationships that I'm developing with the peasants it's weird it's and those are exactly the words that he said he was like it's weird the relationships with the peasants become weird and I think that tells a lot about him as a person who was really not that connected to the common folk although he uh, presented himself as being, you know, very connected to the people, right? As representing the interests of the people, you know, not so much connected to them, but definitely as somebody um, who represented them. He he thought of himself in that way. So he spends a couple of years in Samara, um, and he still is studying, studying, studying Marxism, and gets together a group of people around himself that are kind of his allies and his intellectual circle. So, his mother though, she keeps writing to people because she still had connections. Because she was a legit member of aristocracy, she has those connections, people she could ask for help. And so she keeps just reaching out over and over again, reaching out to try to um, somehow somehow convince, convince the, those who had the power to give him a chance to go to school again. And she actually succeeds, uh, like two years after he gets kicked out of Kazan State University. Uh, they let him study at the St. Petersburg University. This is actually a weird choice because that's closer to the Tsar and that's closer to the government at the time because that's where the capital of the country was at the time. So anyway, um, they let him study, but they would only let him study externally, which means he could like basically test out of, of classes. And Lenin does that, he does that, he tests out of classes and now uh, he becomes he becomes one of the youngest lawyers in Russia at the time because he was still pretty young, he was at the time probably just about 20, 21, 22. So he tests out and at the same time, it actually is happening at the same time when Olga, his beloved sister who he loved a lot, uh, goes to school there as well. But unfortunately, she passes away and Lenin ends up being the person who takes her to the hospital where she ends up dying. He ends up graduating, as I've said, and he ends up um, practicing law a little bit. Uh, he stays around the capital and he practices law. And so what, um, he still builds up his reputation in the revolutionary circles. He still has those same intellectual circles. 
that he had before in a way and so um yeah so for a couple of years there and that's when he meets his wife uh, also part of those revolutionary circles for a while so now uh, a couple of years down the road long story short um he ends up traveling to europe a few times and ends up basically trafficking a bunch of illegal literature marxist marxist communist socialist literature to russia and he gets arrested for that he gets arrested for that and he ends up in jail so he ends up actually sitting in a jail for a year before he gets sentenced but uh i guess that's not something weird in russia back those days back in those days because he's uh, what he was trying to do was really really revolutionary at the time and he was against the czar and czar was in charge of everything so <clears throat> Um, he ends up going to jail, but the peculiar thing is that although he was in there for the literature, for dissemination of illegal literature, of Marxist literature, he ends up having, um, by some accounts, of up to 200 books with him in his cell, and he keeps on writing, and he keeps being influential. And that makes me think, like, there must have been more people uh, in on this whole thing that was happening uh, on conspiracy, communist or Marxist conspiracy or German conspiracy, whatever you want because how does this, can you explain it to me, how could this happen? A person who gets into jail for, uh, I'm totally drinking vodka by the way how can a person who is in jail for dissemating literature, has so many books in his cell and keeps on writing influencing people and the guards are aware of that and they just let it go so after jail uh, he is exiled to Siberia, but the Siberia that he gets exiled into is not the kind of Siberia that they show in American movies, right? Where it's really cold and tough. He actually gets into one of the southernmost points of Siberia. It's called Shukshino, and uh, that's where he actually marries his wife, who ends up just lying to people saying that they're engaged so she could get in there, and they end up marrying there. And a lot of people think to this day that they were just um, allies in terms of you know Marxism and revolution, but they were not. Uh, it wasn't their relationship that came first. But anyway, so he actually gets married in a church, not because he loved the church so much, but because it was the way thing you had to do things in Russia back in the day. So he ends up being in, uh, spending some time in this uh, in this exile. But the again, there was were very nice uh, accommodations there. Nice, sir. Uh, than other people who actually went to the actual Siberia where it, it gets cold um, So it, and they they were recalling how they would rent fishing and going to the beach and hunting and doing all those things that aristocracy Would do anyway and if they were at home somewhere, right? So anyway um, So he spends a couple of years there and after that he moves to another city to Penza. That's another kind of um, town It's not a city in Russia so in Penza, um, he starts working on his publication, it's called Iskra, and it became actually one of the more influential publications, and it ended up being, um, it ended up being pretty influential for the next 50 years. Um, and so that, that, was pro that was going on for a couple of years, and then after, after that, um, again, long story short, he ends up immigrating to Europe. Not immigrating, but leaving, leaving. And he stays in Europe for the next 17 years. He practically stayed in Europe um, until, until after um, monarchy was abolished, until after the February re Revolution of the 17th. So if you think that Lenin was like there from the start all the way through, uh, he actually, he wasn't there for too long. When he came back to Russia in 1917, so he left in the beginning of the 1900s and he came back in 1917. He didn't know anything about Russia. Uh, there's no reason to believe he was anywhere close to people, to the Russian people, intellectually or in any way. He understood what they wanted, and especially the working class. I have to say that those years when he was abroad were pretty productive in terms of his work because he that's where he ends up meeting Trotsky that will be another influential figure in the majoritarian, majoritarian party, um, communistic party of Russia because the party at about the same time 
it splits into two parties minoritarians and majoritarians they have a different name for it in russian but i think it's more appropriate to just keep it to english here but uh anyway so um yeah yeah so while lenin is away abroad the party ends up splitting there's another revolution in 1905 the beginning of the 1900th century was the time when russia was actually growing uh, you know as a country it um as an economy it exported a lot it was the leading exporter of quite a few goods and it was growing and the prime minister at the time was Stalipin who he ends up being killed as well and his reforms won't, won't, wouldn't end up realized but even Lenin would say later on that if those reforms were successful and those were capitalistic reforms if they were successful and they were carried on till the end uh, there would be no revolution and what ends up being critical and one of the reasons that um, Lenin and his, and his followers will succeed is, be, is because um, Russia ends up being dragged into the First World War. It ends up being dragged into it. The focus of everyone's focus becomes now not on the revolution, not on the revolutionaries um, as it was before. It becomes on winning the war or at least getting out of it with minimal, minimal impact, minimal neg negative impact on the country. Um, and actually, Russia was pretty successful in that war for a long time, uh, but um, there was this one winter, the winter of 1917. Since um, kind of uh, St. Petersburg is a little bit further from, it's 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 just, just like it's hard to get stuff there um, because everything was was getting there by the train. And in the winter of 1917. Um, the snow was just so bad, they couldn't get anything inside, into the capital. And the situation became very volatile, and uh, I'm not gonna get into this, because it's another fascinating video how this all happened, but basically, um, it created a perfect environment for something like a revolution. So, and um, the revolution, the night of the 19th, of the February of the 1917th, happened obviously without Lenin. Now, though, uh, he, came, uh, he could come back, come back. In the April of 1917, Lenin is coming back to Russia. And at the time, he's not a very known figure. You gotta understand, he was away for that long. He's not very known. But Trotsky, his other ally, he is actually well known. And for a long time, Lenin was would tell Trotsky that he should become the leader of the uh, Soviet party, but Trotsky, Trotsky himself, he would say that Jewish people cannot be, it's not good, it's not good for a Jewish person to be the leader of Russia. That's what Trotsky said, and some, and ends up, Lenin ends up being the leader, although he's not, he's kind of known, but he's not super famous. He's not super influential at the time in Russia. But yeah, okay, so he ends up uh, first coming back to Russia in 1917 and they were trying to go ahead with the revolution, but it, it fails again. And it's something that just like keeps happening to Lenin. He gets lucky, but then he's so, cl so he's so close to failing. So Lenin ends up hiding a little for a little bit there in the outskirts of St. Petersburg. And again, it seemed like at the time the revolution failed completely because because now uh, the central power, the provisional government, who was, by the way, do who do you think was in charge by of, of the provisional government at the time? It was Kerensky, who was the son of a high school principal where Lenin went to school, of Lenin's high school principal, basically. Um, yeah, he was his son, and that guy, uh, that guy actually ends up leaving Russia. He ends up running away when Lenin becomes comes to power because that guy was the leader of Mensheviks or a minoritarian party. So, and he ends up actually living and he let, he ends up living a long life. He lived up to 91 and he died in New York City. But uh, what happens at the time is that some, uh, basically the leader of the army and who, whose name was Karnilov and uh, the leader of minoritarians and the leader of the professional government at the time, Kerensky, they end up having a fight. And that what that does is that provisional government or the actual government ends up having no power anymore, right? 
no no military power anymore because now kind of the military is divided and um they just by themselves and and then and the, that's when lenin comes and that's when they take advantage of kind of that situation and um they end up carrying the october revolution that actually happened on november 7th it didn't actually happen in um in october by the way um lenin would take a vacation in december right after the revolution he was actually known for that he would take random vacations for no good reason um all throughout all throughout like right after the revolution like two weeks after well, what do you need a vacation for you and throughout 18 19 and 20 only for three years he actually and is the real is in power in russia and actually right after october revolution they carried a legitimate election uh to the government and bolsheviks didn't win uh they only had about a quarter of seats um but now they did a bunch of politicking somehow they threw out threw away the rest of the legitimate government and they ended up being in power which again just highlights how they didn't have anyone's interest except for their own in mind another thing that i forgot to mention to you guys is that Kornilov, that was the general of the army of the provisional government was convinced that lenin was a spy and he was actually working for the german government to destabilize russia so that russia loses in the first world war which was still ongoing at the time but i'm kidding you not uh actually they were trying to give lenin a nobel prize at the end of, at the end of 1917 he was up for a nobel prize but the condition was for Russia to to get out of the First World War by the end of 17. It didn't happen, so he didn't end up giving the Nobel Prize. And so it begins. So begins um, Lenin being in power of the Soviet Union. We're still we're still in First World War though, and he's trying to just wrap it up. He has no. I I should tell you that in around 1915. Well, no. Just before 1917 began, Russia was winning the war, right? It was about to win the war, but that's when everything happened. That's when the famine in St. Petersburg started that kind of aggravated the people and nothing just went to, to plan anymore. And they, yeah, and that's when the revolution happened. People were just too distracted. Everyone who had any, he was in charge of anything was too distracted with the revolution. So it's no wonder that it, it uh, Russia just ended up losing all of its positions throughout the 1917 because all the action was happening, too much action was happening in the capital. So now we are in, so the, the 1917, 1918, in 1918 basically the First World War was done because Russia seceded, right? And that was what Lenin wanted. And after that, it was not the end of struggle for Russians though, because what followed right after was the civil war, the Russian civil war. Um, and that uh, brought up even more hardships again to people who just went through a revolution for the first world war. Now it was all over again, right? And so what that ended up doing was that uh, uh, it was just, there were no common belief that the Bolsheviks and the people who supported Lenin knew everything and they had Russia's interest in, at heart. So people started being disillusioned and there were a lot of people who were against that. And so that's how the country split into the whites and the reds and the reds were communists and the whites were mostly people who supported um, a less, uh, less socialistic regime. And basically they supported either an old order or capitalism. And uh, a lot of European countries supported those troops. And a lot of those were basically, a lot of those troops were previously served the emperor. So I'm back and I put on these two unicorns here. <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, so the country was split into the supporters of the, uh, so basically who were against Bolsheviks and those who were for them. And so what that ends up doing is that it actually became, it, 
brought up more, more devastation. It brought famine, one of the greatest famines that Russia has ever seen. It's in all the history books. One of them was in the Volga region, that's where I'm from. And um, so what they end up, Bolsheviks end up doing, they wanted to kind of control the situation with, um, with socialistic methods. They wanted to socialize the industry and they did it, right? Right around when they came to power. But then um, what this new civil war brought up was that they started confiscating, they accused all the wealthier agrarian uh, entrepreneurs, um, they called them kulaks, they accused them of hoarding uh, grain, of hoarding food, and they just basically empowered, um, they canceled all the laws that existed in Russian Empire before, and they empowered people and they empowered the military to take away food from the wealthier peasants, and basically, uh, basically wealthy, wealthy entrepreneurs, and spread it to the people. And so what I have to tell you is that I basically don't know anyone who wouldn't, whose family wouldn't have been impacted by that. Because they not only took uh, food from the wealthy people, they took it from everywhere, from everyone. Um, and they just redistributed it um, for the military or they just like stole. It became an anarchy, anarchy because again, they had no accountability, those people. And for some families, you have to understand that Russia just abolished slavery in 1816 and 1862. And now those people who were wealthier and wealthier peasants and wealthier agricultural entrepreneurs, so to say, this is something they've accomplished within the generation or two generations. So they just built a little bit of wealth and that was all taken away. And my family was impacted by that and everyone's, everyone's family was impacted by that in one way or the other. Um, and that's kind of was the beginning of the Red Terror because the next step was that they would just create organizations that were after everyone who was against socialism and against um, against against Bolsheviks. And they Lenin actually empowered people to torture other people. And I've been to some of those torture chambers. Uh, there are museums right now, and those were like. Some of those people used um, torture tools from medieval, like medieval type of torture tools on people because they would just randomly accuse whoever they wouldn't like. They would accuse them of uh, being, of conspiring against communism, it's, it's, it's conspiring against the revolutionary power. And so it was happening all over Russia for a while there. Uh, later, around 1920, 1921, um, Lenin became disillusioned with that and he began realizing that maybe it's some, a little bit of capitalism is good and that's when he introduced a new economic policy that did let a little bit of capitalistic activity, they did let some of the small entrepreneurs to have businesses of basically entrepreneurship with, with for businesses who had less than 20 people. And this is so telling, guys, that even Lenin, by the end of his life, he understood that capitalism is good. Uh, he, he did, though, think that um, this was just a necessary step to let those kind of um, businesses grow until they are in, yeah, until they are nationalized. So uh, maybe he didn't learn his lesson by the end of his days. And that was it. Practically, he only was in power for three years, and we do think of him as such a global figure who was in power for forever and he still is in power. In many ways that's true, but it's also very symbolic. He wasn't really um, out there for that long and he lived most of his productive life abroad and he traveled a lot there, even after he became um, the leader. In 1918, this is when his first assassination attempt happens. And then there was another one by Penny Kaplan and that was the famous one uh, when he got injured severely and parts of the bullets stayed in his body and by 1921 Lenin became really sick um, he became really sick and they were trying to figure out what's wrong with him but they never did they removed those bullets uh, and they were thinking that maybe pieces of those bullets they had lead in them and they were poisoning his body but they removed them and his condition didn't change some people also believed that he had syphilis and, and it was just it was not publicly known because they were trying to cover this up. Others uh, think that Stalin might have been 
poisoning him or trying to, yeah, and that could be true because his relationship with Stalin was degradating a lot um, by then, by kind of by 1921. So 1921, 22, 23, he was really sick and he was dead by 1920, by the January of 1923. And he was carried into, into mausoleum, his brain was removed and his body was mummified. And he's still there till this day, which is kind of seems barbaric for a nation that calls themselves Europeans. Anyway, um, so right before his death, uh, one of his alleged lovers or girlfriends or mistresses died. It was Armand, Ines Armand, another significant woman in his life, and he was devastated by his by her loss. He was in by the end of by 1922. He was in wheelchair and he was really sick, he suffered three strokes. Um, yeah, so the end of his life was pretty terrible and he again suffered a major, another major loss right there. And he was asking Stalin and his wife, Krupskaya, to bring him cyanide to kill himself, but that never happened, so he just died nat of natural causes, so to say. Um, so another point that I've never mentioned to you is why women were so into his 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 um, philosophy? The reason is because uh, socialists give, give, were giving women equality, and that's something I find quite fascinating. Because Russia was actually the first country in the world who led women to divorce by at their own will, and um, the rights of women were expanded under socialism greatly because they were equalized to men. Everyone under socialism was equal, right? So yeah, for a woman, this communistic socialistic philosophy was really attractive back in the day because they had no rights. Um, and I would actually have to tell you that when I first came to the United States, I was amazed that women in this country only started being equally, equally participating in the economy, maybe in the boomers generation, but not so much more before that. Whereas for us, it happened already 100 years ago, over 100 years ago. And another thing that I forgot to mention about Lenin was obviously gulags. So he started those concentration camps. Um, he used people who allegedly were against socialism or were against the revolution. He basically imprisoned them and used him as slave labor. And a lot of Russian infrastructure was built by those in gulags. And gulags carried on for years for years after Lenin. I don't think he understood what he was building and how far it's gonna go because it was exploited for so much longer than I think he anticipated and anybody in their mind, in their lucid mind, anticipated. Um, by, I think by 1923, so after Lenin's death, um, there were about uh, 315 camps and they had about 70,000 inmates. And those, in a lot of cases, those were um, smart people, intelligent people, aristocracy. So, because they were deemed a threat to the revolution and some of them were working on engineering projects and things like that, but a lot of them were just used like slave labor. So yeah, so Lenin ended up dying um, in January 1923 and um, so he lived a crazy life he was actually not so not known until about when he was 47 years old and that's a late start right there and he was only in power for about four years and then he died quite young what do you think about his story what do you think about my makeup what do you think about those vi this video let me know in the comments down below do you think he was crazy or do you think he was just really empowered by the ideas of Marxism? Do you believe those ideas are popular in the United States these days or not? Do you think that maybe the development, the industrial development undergone by the country, by Russia in those years was worth the sacrifice? But he would emphasize that the violence is needed for the revolution. He would emphasize that over and over again, he would empower people, violent people, who just wanted to torture others and see others suffer. And he was just saying that those killings just were go after them he would say and this is all necessary for the greater good of the people but he was never actually chosen by the people um neither was his party it was not really supported by the people throughout the revolution throughout the beginning of the 19th 20th century in russia 
Bolsheviks and Socialist Party was frequently questioned by the workers because they thought that it was not representing their interest. Anyway, let me know in the comments down below what do you think. I'll be responding to each and one of you. Subscribe to my channel because that really helps and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Guys, I forgot to pop on some mascara like an idiot, so here's a look with the mascara.